The Background 1. The Travellers and the Grapes There are three forms of culture. Worldly culture, the mere acquisition of information. Religious culture, following rules. Elite culture, self-development. The Master Hujwiri, Revelation of the Veiled. There is a story in Aesop's Fables about a young mole who went to his mother and told her that he could see. Now, as most people know, sight is something traditionally lacking in moles. This one's mother decided to test him. She accordingly placed in front of him a piece of frankincense and asked him what it was. A stone, said the little mole. Not only are you blind, his mother answered, but you have lost your sense of smell as well. Aesop, esteemed traditionally by Sufis as a practical teacher in an immemorial tradition of wisdom gained through the conscious exercise of the mind, body and perceptions, is not allowed much distinction by the overt meaning of this tale. The lameness of some of the morals, actually superficial glosses, of the Aesopian stories has been noticed by many students. We can analyse the story to see what it really means if we know something of the Sufi tradition and its method of concealing meanings in literature. Mole, in Arabic, khuld, from the radical K-H-L-D, is written in the same way as khalad, which stands for eternity, paradise, thought, mind, soul according to the context. Because only the consonants are written, there is no way of telling, in isolation, which word is intended. If this word were used poetically in a Semitic language and then translated into Greek by someone who did not understand the double meaning, the play upon words would be lost. Why the stone and scent? Because in Sufi tradition, Moses, a guide to his people, made a stone as fragrant as musk, Hakim Sinai, the walled garden of truth. Moses symbolizes a guiding thought, which transforms something apparently inanimate and inert into something as fragrant as musk, something with what might almost be called a life of its own. Our story now shows us that the mother of the thought, its origin, matrix, essential quality, presents frankincense, impalpable experience, to the thought or mind. Because the individual, the mole, is concentrating upon sight, trying to develop faculties in the wrong order, it even loses the power to use the ones which it should have. The human being, according to the Sufis, instead of reaching within himself in a certain manner in order to find and attain his development, searches outside and follows illusions, metaphysical systems wrongly developed, which in fact cripple him. What is the inner potentiality of the mole? we can now look at the whole group of words in Arabic which belong to the root K-H-L-D, which we are considering. Khalad, K-H-A-L-A-D, ever-abiding, long-lasting. Khalad, K-H-A-L-L-A-D, to perpetuate a thing. Akhlad, A-K-H-L-A-D, to lean toward, to adhere faithfully to, a friend. Khuld, K-H-U-L-D, eternity, paradise, continuity. Khuld, K-H-U-L-D, mole, field rat, lark, bird. Khalad, K-H-A-L-A-D, thought, mind, soul. el Kualid. E-L-K-H-U-A-L-I-D Mountains, rocks, supporters of a pot. 
To the Sufi, this grouping of words around a basic root conveys essentials for human forward development. It is almost a map of Sufism. The mole, because of coincidence, can be chosen as a symbol of the mind or thought. In the same mind there is eternity, continuity, support. Sufism is concerned with the perpetuation of the human consciousness through its source in the mind. Faithfulness in association with others is an essential of this task. The Aesopian story, therefore, does not mean, as its commentators would believe, that it is easy to unmask an imposter. We need not deny that the tale could have fulfilled this function for centuries. But the use of the incense and the mole, plus the Sufi tradition that certain secrets are concealed in such words as those of Aesop, help us to unlock the door. Looking at a great deal of literary and philosophical material in this light, we are irresistibly reminded of the message of Rumi, himself, like Aesop, a great fabulist of Asia Minor. He says that the canal may not itself drink, but it performs the function of conveying water to the thirsty. Those who are interested in this interpretation of the mole symbolism might well feel that the light-hearted potted wisdom of Aesop has been the carrier of the nutrition which we now find in it. Rumi lived nearly 2,000 years after Aesop, and he said, A tale, fictitious or otherwise, illuminates truth. There is no need to pursue the Arabic language itself as the actual source of the Semitic version from which this Aesopian tale comes. Arabic is useful to us as a tool because, as philologists have demonstrated, it retains in close association words grouped according to a primitive pattern whose meanings have become very corrupted in other Semitic languages. There are, in the West as well as the East, quite numerous examples of similar crystallization of teaching in literature, ritual and folk belief. Many such phenomena are considered unimportant, like the jokes attributed to Nasruddin, Joe Miller and others, read for their face value. Much of Omar Khayyam's poetry, intended to make the reader think clearly through reducing life to absurdity, has been taken in the superficial sense that Khayyam was a pessimist. Platonic material, intended according to the Sufis to show the limitations of formal logic and the ease of falling into false reasoning, has been considered defective and nothing more. In some cases, as with Aesop, the canal still carries the water, though it is not recognised as a canal. In other formulations, people carry on meaningless rituals and beliefs which they have rationalised until they have no real dynamic and are really only of antiquarian interest. The great Sufi poet Jami says of them, the dry cloud, waterless, can have no rain-giving quality. And yet such cults, often mere counterfeits of carefully organised symbolism based on poetic analogy, are often seriously studied. Some people think that they contain certain metaphysical or magical truths, others that they are themselves of historical importance. In the cases where a cult or grouping of people are following a theme mapped out originally on certain word groupings, it is impossible to understand them or even to trace their history unless we know that this is what originally happened. Because of its peculiarly mathematical nature, and because it was chosen as the framework for presenting certain knowledge to the East and West during the Middle Ages, Arabic is most important in this study. Again, because of the almost algebraic method of producing words from a basic three-letter form, Arabic has a great simplicity which would hardly have been expected by anyone who does not know it. In many cases we are dealing only with words, groups of consonants, not with grammar, syntax, even with the Arabic letters, because they can all be rendered sufficiently well for our purpose by means of Latin letters. We substitute one letter for another. 
At the most, we modify that letter in order to tell us which one the original was. This, in substance, is an art which has been used very widely in the countries of the East, where Arabic letters and Sufi law have penetrated, and used by people who have no deep knowledge of Arabic itself. Arabic, then, was discovered to be susceptible to use as a code by certain people in the East, and also in the Latin West of the Middle Ages. Many of the adepts of Sufism, though well versed in Arabic, have refused to use it except when they desire to use it for a specific purpose. They traditionally adhere to this practice even in circles where a knowledge of Arabic is considered to be essential to a cultivated man. As a consequence, even some of the very greatest masters have from time to time been considered insufficiently educated by literary observers. There are many stories about this subject. The reasons for not using Arabic are 1. If the Sufi is following at the time the path of blame, he finds it necessary to incur certain feelings of opposition in his hearers. This is best done, in the case of a highly language-conscious people like the Arabs, by not speaking their language, from their point of view a serious shortcoming. Two. Because of the fixed idea of Arabic supremacy, the Sufi has to detach the individual from the assumption that all great men must speak Arabic. 3. The Sufi cannot be forced into the scholastic culture pattern devised by others without compromising his own teachings. 4. There are distinct circumstances when communication on a verbal basis by familiar methods, is not indicated. The Sufi's state tells him what this is. In the case of the ordinary man, such a refinement of perception is not possible, and he therefore strives unthinkingly to communicate information and ideas on the basic assumption that when people meet, their identity of linguistic ability is a good and necessary thing. The great Sufi and great Sheikh of Khorasan, Abu Hafs al Haddadi, knew no Arabic, it was reported. Hujwiri, Revelation of the Veiled. He spoke through interpreters. When he went to Baghdad to visit such giants as Junaid, he spoke so eloquently in Arabic that he had no equal. This is a typical story. The Sufi, for whom Sufism is more important than anything else, will embody in his own self-development a technique of this kind and combine it with the impact which he is making upon others. It is never his aim to further his own reputation in academic circles. Those who have viewed Sufism as a Persian cult whose practitioners harboured animosity towards the Arabs and sought to reduce the importance of Arabic as one of their techniques completely misunderstand the role of language in Sufism. Similar techniques are reported in the use of languages other than Arabic. The relationship of parent to child, mole and mother, is used by Sufis to denote the training toward full sight, as well as the ultimate relationship between the Sufi and the ultimate sight of objective truth. To the Sufi, Religious incarnation or effigy conveying this relationship is merely a rough and secondary method of portraying something which has happened to an individual or a group, a religious experience showing them the way to self-realization. The perfected Sufi is great, exalted. He is sublime. Through love, work and harmony, he has attained the highest degree of mastership. All secrets are open to him and his whole being is imbued with magical effulgence. He is the guide and the traveller on the way of infinite beauty, love, attainment, power, fulfilment, the guardian of the most ancient wisdom, the trailblazer to the highest secrets, the beloved friend whose very being elevates us, bringing new meaning to the spirit of humanity. This is one portrayal of the Sufi by a contemporary writer who is not himself a Sufi, though he has lived among the followers of the way of love.
The Sufi seems to the unregenerate man to change, but to those with inner perception he remains the same, because his essential personality is within and not without. A scholar in Kashmir, which for centuries was a centre of Sufi teaching, made in the 17th century what would today be called a survey of the general characteristics of Sufi mystics. This was Sirajuddin, who travelled in all the adjacent countries, and even to Java, China and the Sahara, talking to Sufis and collecting their unwritten law. The Sufi, he says, is the complete man. When he says, among roses be a rose, among thorns be a thorn, he is not inevitably referring to social behaviour. The Sufis are poets and lovers. According to the ground in which their teaching grows, they are soldiers, administrators or physicians. According to the eyes of the beholder, they may see magicians, mystics, practitioners of incomprehensible arts. If you revere them as saints, you will benefit by their sainthood. But if you work with them as associates, you will benefit from their company. To them, the world is a fashioning instrument which polishes mankind. They, by identification with the processes of continuous creation, are themselves fashioners of other complete men. Some talk, others are silent. Some walk, it seems, restlessly. Others sit and teach. To understand them, you must bring into action an intelligence which is an intuitive one, normally held down by its friendly enemy, the intelligence of the logical mind. Until you can understand illogicality and the meaningfulness of it, shun the Sufis except for limited, precise, self-evident services. Safanama of Sirajuddin Abbasi, 1649 A Sufi, the Sufis, cannot be defined by any single set of words or ideas. By a picture, moving and made up of different dimensions, perhaps. Rumi, one of the greatest mystical masters, tells us in a famous passage that the Sufi is drunk without wine, sated without food, distraught, foodless and sleepless, a king beneath a humble cloak, a treasure within a ruin, not of air and earth, not of fire and water, a sea without bounds. He has a hundred moons and skies and suns. He is wise through universal truth, not a scholar from a book. The Reverend Canon Sell, a specialist of Sufism, seems to think that this booklessness is something to do with theology of all things. Mere learning from books will not make a theologian, he says, in a footnote to this. Dr. Sell, Sufism. He finds Rumi difficult, saying, It is only very patient students who can find the esoteric meaning of the poet. Is he a man of religion? No. He is far, far more. He is beyond atheism and faith alike. What are merit and sin to him? He is hidden. Seek him. The Sufi, as we are told in these most famous words from the 13th century Divan of Shams of Tabriz, is hidden. Hidden more deeply than the practitioner of any secret school. Yet individual Sufis are known in their thousands throughout the East. Settlements of Sufis are found in the lands of the Arabs, the Turks, the Persians, Afghans, Indians, Malays. The more the dogged searchers of the Western world have tried to dig out the secrets of the Sufi, the more hopelessly complex the task has seemed to be. Their work thus litters the fields of mysticism, Arabism, Orientalism, history, philosophy and even general literature. The secret, in the Sufi phrase, protects itself. It is found only in the spirit and the practice of the work. 
A distinguished professor of archaeology is perhaps the greatest living Western authority on the Sufis, because he is a Sufi, not because he is an academician. The ordinary man or woman in the East often looks upon the Sufi as the Westerner might imagine an Oriental mystic should be. A man endowed with supernatural powers, inheritor of secrets handed down from uncounted ages, symbolic of wisdom and timelessness. The Sufi can read your thoughts, transport himself from one place to another in an instant, is in a special, continuing relationship with things of another world. Sufis are usually believed to have healing powers, and there is no scarcity of people who will tell you that they were made whole by Sufis through a glance or in some other inexplicable manner. The communication between minds which is established by Sufism has several aspects. By means of the tasaruf exercises, which clear the individuality, there is an interaction of minds. This is used by Sufis for purposes of healing, and it is through this technique that most of their inexplicable cures are effected, aside from the application of simpler techniques. See J. Halaji, Hypnotherapeutic Techniques in a Central Asian Community, International Journal of Clinical and Experimental Hypnosis, October 1962. Jung's theory of the collective unconscious is expounded by the Spaniard Ibn Rushud, 1126 to 1198. It was also often referred to by Rumi, and its meaning and force are subjects of Sufi specialization. Rumi notes that this phenomenon is one of a higher consciousness. Animality has division in the spirit. The human spirit has one soul. This is generally referred to as the great soul. Sufis are thought to excel at their chosen vocations, and numerous individuals are pointed out as proof of this belief. They make mistakes, so the contention is, far less frequently than other people, and they approach things in a manner which nobody else would. Yet their actions are vindicated by events. This fact is attributed to a form of foreknowledge, they believe themselves to be taking part in the higher evolution of humanity. If popular beliefs, which may include what amounts to saint worship throughout the Middle East, are far-reaching, they are eclipsed by legends and traditions of Sufi masters, personalities revered by members of all faiths. The Sufi ancients could walk on water, describe events taking place at vast distances, experience the true reality of life, and much more in the same vein. When one master spoke, his hearers went into a state of mystical rapture and developed magical powers. Wherever Sufis went, mystics of other persuasions, often of great prominence, became their disciples, sometimes without a word having been spoken. In the material world, Sufi ascendancy is based upon work and creativity and generally accepted because of the achievements of individual Sufis. Sufi philosophical and scientific discoveries are widely considered to have been achieved through their special powers. The conventional theosophist or intellectual finds himself in the uncomfortable position that Although he must often deny the likelihood of a special form of consciousness accessible to an elite of this kind, he has to accept that Sufis are national heroes in some countries and are responsible for the development of classical literature in others. It is estimated that between 20 and 40 million people are members of or affiliated to Sufi schools, and the Sufis are increasing in numbers. The Sufi may be your neighbour, the man across the street, the woman who does your chores, a recluse at times, rich or poor. No investigation into the reality of Sufism can be made entirely from the outside, because Sufism includes participation, training and experience. Although Sufis have written innumerable books, these may apply to specific circumstances, 
seem to contradict one another, cannot be understood by the uninitiated, or are found to have meanings other than the superficial one. They are usually studied by outsiders only very superficially. One difficulty of getting to grips with Sufism through its Eastern literature has been noticed by many scholars who have made the attempt, including Professor Nicholson, who laboured long to understand and make available Sufic thinking to the West. In presenting selections of some Sufi writings, he admits that a great deal is peculiar and unique, so that the writings in which it occurs seldom impart their real significance except to those who possess the key to the cipher, while the uninitiated will either understand them literally or not at all. R. A. Nicholson, Tales of Mystic Meaning, London, 1931, page 171. A book such as the present one designs itself in a Sufistic manner, for by definition it must follow a Sufic, not a conventional pattern, and hence its material and treatment are of a special nature, not subject to approach by means of familiar criteria. This is the method known as scatter, by which an impact is considered effective by virtue of its multiple activity. In ordinary life, certain forms of understanding become possible because of experience. The human mind is what it is partly because of the impacts to which it has been exposed and its ability to use those impacts. The interaction between impact and mind determines the quality of the personality. In Sufism, this normal physical and mental process is engaged in consciously. The result is felt to be more efficient, and wisdom, instead of being a matter of time, age and accident, is regarded as inevitable. Sufis liken this process to the analogy between a savage who eats everything and a discriminating man who eats what is good for him, as well as tasty. It would be absurd to attempt to convey the meaning of Sufi thought and action in a conventional, simplified or conversational manner for the above reasons. This absurdity is summarised by the Sufi tag as sending a kiss by messenger. Sufism may be natural, but it is also a part of higher human development and conscious development at that. An adequate vehicle for its presentation usually does not exist in societies where it has not been operating in this advanced form. On the other hand, a climate for its presentation, part literary, part expository, part example and so on, has been prepared in other areas. Metaphysically minded people, and especially those who feel that they are comfortable in the domain of mysticism or inner perception, have no greater start on the generality of humanity where the acceptance of Sufism is concerned. Their subjectivity, especially where it is linked with a strong sense of personal uniqueness caught from other people, can in fact be a serious disability. There is no simplified Sufism. Yet it disappears from the area of cognition of such ill-defined minds as may be confident that they can understand it, penetrate anything spiritual by virtue of what is truly a woolly, self-assumed perceptiveness. To the Sufi, such a personality, however vocal he may be, and he often is, hardly exists at all. Anyone who says... It is also indescribable, but I just feel what you mean, is unlikely to be able to profit by Sufism. For Sufis are working, are carrying out an effort to awaken a certain field of consciousness by means of an approach which is specialised, not fortuitous. Sufism does not trade in airy fairiness, mutual admiration or lukewarm generalities. When the bite disappears so too does the Sufic element from a situation. The converse is also true. Sufism is not directed to a section of the community, for no such section exists, but to a certain faculty within individuals. Where this faculty is not activated, 
there is no Sufism. It contains hard as well as soft realities, discord as well as harmony, the sharp brightness of awakening as well as the gentle dark of a lulling to sleep. This central factor is well expressed in Sufi poetry, which is often perfect in a technical sense, and sometimes human, sometimes startlingly different. Generations of conventional prosodists have spent their lives analysing this unique property by a different yardstick, in terms of a poet's variations in quality. One Sufi poet replies like this, O cat with a taste for sour cream, connoisseur of shades of bitterness. You belong to the litter that has agreed about yoghurt. You hate with equal meaning the cheese, butter and milk warm from the udder. You are no cheesemonger, you say? Verily, he is closer to you than your jugular vein. And another, with an oddly modern echo of reference to slick writings. Shall we paint a perfect picture, or design a perfect rug? Then shall we thump our tongues all night to find out wherein each has strayed from perfection. This is good. This is a task for a complete man, and for such a child as is intent upon the consistency of the materials which alone will give perfection to his mud pie. Anyone who has tasted the firm, but not too hard, aseptic cheeses of the contemporary supermarket will be able to share the poet's feelings about food, if nothing else. Hilali, accused of using a sword to sever a thread, said, Shall I rather use honey to drown a camel? There are imitation Sufis who try to benefit from the prestige which attaches to the name. Some of them have written books, which only add to a general perplexity among outsiders. It is possible that much of the Sufic spirit may be transmitted in writing, if one accepts the fact that Sufism has to be experienced continually as well as tested vicariously. It does not depend upon the impact only of artistic forms, but of life upon life. Sufism, in one definition, is human life. Occult and metaphysical powers are largely incidental. Though they may play their part in the process, if not in personal prominence or satisfaction. It is axiomatic that the attempt to become a Sufi through a desire for personal power, as normally understood, will not succeed. Only the search for truth is valid, the desire for wisdom the motive. The method is assimilation, not study. In observing the Sufis by means of what are in fact derivations of Sufi techniques, we shall have to look at many things which may be important at first, but which will cease to have the same significance as we proceed. This technique can easily be illustrated. A child learns to read by mastering the alphabet. When he can read words, he retains the knowledge of the letters, but reads whole words. If we were to concentrate upon letters, he would be severely handicapped by what was useful only at an earlier stage. Both words and letters should now have a more settled perspective, thus the Sufic method. The process is easier than it sounds, even if only because doing a thing may often be easier than describing it. I report a glimpse of Sufis in a circle, halka, the basic unit and very heart of active Sufism. A group of seekers is attracted to a teaching master and attends his Thursday evening assembly. The first part of the proceedings is the less formal time, when questions are asked and students received. On this occasion, a newcomer had just asked our teacher, the Aga, whether there was a basic urge toward mystical experience shared by all humanity. We have a word, replied the Aga, which sums all this up. It describes what we are doing, and it summarizes our way of thinking. 
Through it you will understand the very reason for our existence, and the reason why mankind is generally speaking at odds. The word is Anguruzuminab Stafil, and he explained it in a traditional Sufi story. Four men, a Persian, a Turk, an Arab, and a Greek, were standing in a village street. They were travelling companions, making for some distant place. But at this moment they were arguing over the spending of a single piece of money, which was all they had among them. I want to buy Angur, said the Persian. I want Azum, said the Turk. I want Inab, said the Arab. No, said the Greek, we should buy Stafil. Another traveller passing, a linguist, said, Give the coin to me. I undertake to satisfy the desires of all of you. At first they would not trust him. Ultimately they let him have the coin. He went to the shop of a fruit seller and bought four small bunches of grapes. This is my angor, said the Persian. But this is what I call azum, said the Turk. You have brought me inab, said the Arab. No, said the Greek, this in my language is stafil. The grapes were shared out among them, and each realised that the disharmony had been due to his faulty understanding of the language of the others. The travellers, said the Aga, are the ordinary people of the world. The linguist is the Sufi. People know that they want something, because there is an inner need existing in them. They may give it different names, but it is the same thing. Those who call it religion have different names for it, and even different ideas as to what it might be. Those who call it ambition try to find its scope in different ways. But it is only when a linguist appears, someone who knows what they really mean, that they can stop the struggling and get on with the eating of the grapes. The group of travellers which he had been describing, he continued, were more advanced than most, in that they actually had a positive idea of what they wanted, even though they could not communicate it. It is far more common for the individual to be at an earlier stage of aspiration than he thinks. He wants something but does not know what it is, though he may think that he knows. The Sufic way of thinking is particularly appropriate in a world of mass communication, when every effort is directed toward making people believe that they want or need certain things, that they should believe certain things that they should, as a consequence, do certain things that their manipulators want them to do. The Sufi speaks of wine, the product of the grape, and its secret potential, as his means of attaining inebriation. The grape is seen as the raw form of the wine. Grapes, then, mean ordinary religion, while wine is the real essence of the fruit. The travellers are therefore seen to be four ordinary people, differing in religion. The Sufi shows them that the basis of their religions is in fact the same. He does not, however, offer them wine, the essence, which is the inner doctrine waiting to be produced and used in mysticism, a field far more developed than mere organised religion. That is a further stage. But the Sufi's role as a servant of humanity is brought out by the fact that, although he is operating on a higher level, he helps the formal religionist as far as he can by showing him the fundamental identity of religious faith. He might, of course, have gone on to a discussion of the merits of wine, but what the travellers wanted was grapes, and grapes they were given. When the wrangling over smaller issues subsides, according to the Sufi, the greater teaching may be imparted. Meanwhile, some sort of primary lesson has been given. The basic urge toward mysticism is never, in the unaltered man, clear enough to be recognised for what it is. 
Rumi, in his version of this story, Mathnavi Book 2, alludes to the Sufi training system when he says that the grapes, pressed together, produce one juice, the wine of Sufism. The Sufis often start from a non-religious viewpoint. Words cannot be used in referring to religious truth except as analogy. Hakim Sinai, The Walled Garden of Truth. The answer, they say, is within the mind of mankind. It has to be liberated, so that by self-knowledge the intuition becomes the guide to human fulfilment. The other way, the way of training, suppresses and stills the intuition. Humanity is turned into a conditioned animal by non-Sufi systems, while being told that it is free and creative, has a choice of thought and action. The Sufi is an individual who believes that by practicing alternate detachment and identification with life, he becomes free. He is a mystic because he believes that he can become attuned to the purpose of all life. He is a practical man because he believes that this process must take place within normal society. And he must serve humanity because he is a part of it. The great El Tourre, contemporary of Omar Khayyam, wrote this warning in 1111 AD. O man, that art so full of information penetrating into secrets, listen, for in silence is safety from slips. They have fostered thee for a purpose, did thou but understand it. Have a care to thyself, lest thou feed with lost sheep. This was translated by Edward Pocock in 1661. In order to succeed in this endeavour, he must follow the methods which have been devised by earlier masters, methods for slipping through the complex of training which makes most people prisoners of their environment and of the effect of their experiences. The exercises of the Sufis have been developed through the interaction of two things, intuition, and the changing aspects of human life. Different methods will suggest themselves intuitively in different societies and at various times. This is not inconsistent, because real intuition is itself always consistent. The Sufi life can be lived at any time, in any place. It does not require withdrawal from the world, or organised movements, or dogma. It is coterminous with the existence of humanity. It cannot, therefore, accurately be termed an Eastern system. It has profoundly influenced both the East and the very bases of the Western civilization in which many of us live, the mixture of Christian, Jewish, Muslim and Near Eastern or Mediterranean heritage, commonly called Western. Mankind, according to the Sufis, is infinitely perfectible. The perfection comes about through attunement with the whole of existence. Physical and spiritual life meet, but only when there is a complete balance between them. Systems which teach withdrawal from the world are regarded as unbalanced. Physical exercises are linked with theoretical patterns. In Sufi psychology, there is an important relationship between for instance, the doctrine of the seven stages of man and the integration of personality, and between movement, experience, and the progressive attainment of a higher personality. The stages in Sufi literature correspond with the transmutation of seven selves, the technical term for which is nafs. Sufi development requires the seeker to pass through seven stages of preparation, before the individuality is ready for its full function. These stages, sometimes called men, are degrees in which the transmutation of the consciousness, the technical term for which is nafs, breath. Briefly, the stages of development, each making possible a further enrichment of the being under the guidance of a practiced teacher, are 1. nafs e amara the depraved, commanding nafs. 2. Nafs-i-lawama, the accusing nafs. 
3. Nafs i mulhama, the inspired nafs. 4. Nafs i mutmaina, the serene nafs. 5. Nafs i radia, the fulfilled nafs. 6. Nafs i madia, the fulfilling nafs. 7. Nafs i safia wa kamila, the purified and complete nafs. The nafs is considered to pass through processes which are termed death and rebirth. The first process, the white death, marks the initiation of the disciple when he starts to reconstruct the automatic and emotional nafs so that it will in turn provide an instrument for proceeding to the activation of conscience, the second nafs. The adjectives serene, fulfilling and so on refer to the effect upon the individual, as well as upon the group and society in general, functions most marked at each stage. Significant phenomena of the seven stages observed during Sufi exercises include these. 1. The individual out of personal control believes himself to be a coherent personality, starts to learn that he, like all undeveloped individuals, has a multiple and changing personality. 2. The dawn of self-awareness and accusation, in which automatic thoughts are seen for what they are. 3. The beginning of real mental integration, when the mind is becoming capable of operating on a higher level than was its previous futile custom. 4. Serene balance. Equilibrium of the individuality. 5. Power of fulfillment. New ranges of experience not susceptible to description beyond approximate analogy. 6. A new activity and function, including extra dimensions of the individuality. 7. Completion of the task of reconstitution. Possibility of teaching others. Capacity for Objective Understanding When and where did the Sufi way of thinking start? This is, to most Sufis, slightly irrelevant to the work at hand. The place of Sufism is within humanity. The place of your sitting room carpet is on the floor of your house, not in Mongolia, where its design may have originated. The practice of the Sufis is too sublime to have a formal beginning, says the Azra el Kadim wal Kadim, Secrets of the Past and Future. But as long as one remembers that history is less important than the present and the future, there is a great deal to be learned from a review of the spread of the modern Sufi trend since it branched out from the areas which were Arabized nearly 1400 years ago. By a glance at this period of development, the Sufis show how and why the message of self-perception may be carried into every conceivable kind of society, irrespective of its nominal religious or social commitment. Sufism is believed by its followers to be the inner, secret teaching that is concealed within every religion, and because its bases are in every human mind already, Sufic development must inevitably find its expression everywhere. The historical period of the teaching starts with the explosion of Islam from the desert into the static societies of the Near East. Toward the middle of the 7th century, the expansion of Islam beyond the borders of Arabia was challenging and was soon to overthrow the empires of the Middle East. Each one had a venerable tradition in the political, military and religious spheres. The armies of Islam, originally composed mainly of Bedouins, but then swollen by recruits of other origins, struck northward, eastward and to the west. The caliphs fell heir to the lands of the Hebrews, the Byzantines, the Persians and the Greco-Buddhists. The conquerors reached the south of France in the west and the valley of the Indus in the east. Those political, military and religious conquests form the nucleus of the Muslim countries and communities of today, 
which extend from Indonesia in the Pacific to Morocco on the Atlantic. It is from this background that the Sufi mystics became known in the West, and they maintained a current of teaching which links people of intuition from the far east to the farthest west. The early caliphs had possessed themselves of more than millions of square miles, uncounted riches and the political supremacy of the known world of the Middle Ages. The centres of learning of the ancients, and particularly the traditional schools of mystical teaching, had almost all fallen into their hands. In Africa, the ancient communities of Egypt, including Alexandria, and farther west, Carthage, where St. Augustine had studied and preached esoteric, pre-Christian doctrines. It has been the custom among most Christian apologists to represent the religion, and especially their own branch of it, as time-centred, referring back to a certain historical fact, the human transition of Jesus. Other versions of the Christian story are labelled heresies. St. Augustine, who is explained away as being tainted with unchristian, i.e. non-conventional, philosophy, said, That which is called the Christian religion existed among the ancients and never did not exist from the beginning of the human race. Epistolae Liber 1, chapter 13, page 3. The deviation of Christianity from the rest of human religion was, of course, the result of a deliberate choice, the decision to regard the events of the life and death of Christ as unique, not as part of a continuous process. It must clearly be remembered that the versions of Christianity most generally available to the average student are those which have prevailed, being most successful, not necessarily the most accurate, historically or otherwise. Palestine and Syria, the homes of secret traditions, Central Asia, where the Buddhists were most firmly entrenched, and northwest India, with its venerable background of mysticism and experiential religion, all were within the empire of Islam. To these centres travelled the Arab mystics, anciently known as the Near Ones, Mukaribun, who believed that essentially there was a unity among the inner teachings of all faiths. Like John the Baptist, they wore camel's wool, and may have been known as Sufis, people of wool, though not for this reason alone. As a result of these contacts with the Hanifs, each one of the ancient centres of secret teaching became a Sufi stronghold. The loss of the Sufic thread in many metaphysical schools, with the resultant failure of these schools to provide a real fulfilment for the followers, is considered by the Sufis to be one cause of the quest, the search for a teacher, which preoccupied so many people in ancient times. Certain companions of Muhammad themselves described this quest as applied to themselves. One of them was Salman the Persian. He related how he tired of the mere rituals of the Zoroastrians and set off southward seeking the faith and practice of the Hanifs. He attached himself first to a Christian teacher, then to another. When the latter died, he told Salman to journey southward in search of an exponent of the Hafenite law. After being captured and sold into slavery, he found the immediate circle of Muhammad's disciples at Medina. What was this practice of the Hanifs, which the Sufis equate with Sufism? The choice of this word as with many others which are only attempts to convey a varied meaning with one root, is believed by the Sufis to explain itself. The triliteral root HNF is basically associated with the concept of leaning on one side, a reference to the rhythmic movements of the Sufis. A derivative of HNF is the form Tahanaf, which means to act like a Hafenite and tahanafi means to do a thing accurately. Here we have a word picture of exercises performed according to a set plan, but also potentially on one side, which Sufis teach means in an eccentric as well as rhythmic manner. The word hanif 
also from the same root, is the noun. It also stands for straightforwardness. Such a variety of meanings would seem baffling if it were not realized that such things as to do a thing accurately and to lean on one side can be equated within a certain system, that of the Sufis. This is not to say, of course, that the root form was invented by the Sufis, or even that the words are not in everyday use in straightforward meanings. The important thing to note is that for the Sufis, certain words are chosen to describe a complex of ideas which accord with a number of Sufi ideas and practices, and build up, on close examination, a word picture. It is as if we were to take a word in English, one with a number of meanings, and use it because within the meanings were found several which, taken together, carried a message or composite presentation of certain essentials. This procedure is rather more elaborate than punning or simple rhyme. It extends the dimension of meaning, as it were, through the word and its derivatives. The gap between the secret law and practice of Christians, Zoroastrians, Hebrews, Hindus, Buddhists and the rest had been bridged. This process, the confluence of essences, has never been grasped by non-Sufis as a reality because such observers find it impossible to realize that the Sufi sees and contacts the Sufic stream in every culture, as a bee will suck from many flowers without becoming a flower. Even the Sufic usage of confluence terminology to denote this function has not penetrated far. Just as students of comparative religion have noted similarities in the externals and doctrines of many faiths, in mysticism, Sufism has continuously stressed the essential identity of the stream of transmission of inner knowledge. In the East, the Mughal prince Darashiko wrote the confluence of the two seas, stressing the meeting between Sufism and early Hindu mysticism. The Rosicrucians in the West adopted almost literally the teaching of the Spanish deluminist Sufis in claiming an unbroken succession of inner teaching in which they included Hermes. The Western Illuminati included Muhammad in their chain of transmitters. Count Michael Meyer in 1617 wrote Symbola Aurea Mensae Duodecim Nationa, Contributions of Twelve Nations to the Golden Table, in which he showed that the Sufic tradition of a succession of teachers was still being maintained. Among the alchemical teachers were several whom the Sufis also recognize including Westerners who had studied Saracen law. They are Hermes of Egypt, Mary the Hebrew, Democritus of Greece, Morianus of Rome, Avicenna, Ibn Sina, of Arabia, Albertus Magnus of Germany, Arnold of Villeneuve of France, Thomas Aquinas of Italy, Raymond Lully of Spain, Roger Bacon of England, Melchior Kibiensis of Hungary, and Anonymous Samata, or Michael Sendivogius of Poland. All Western alchemy, of course, is attributed by tradition to Jeba, Jabir ibn al Hayyan, the Sufi. Sufi mysticism differs tremendously from other cults claiming to be mystical. Formal religion is for the Sufi merely a shell, though a genuine one, which fulfills a function. When the human consciousness has penetrated beyond this social framework, the Sufi understands the real meaning of religion. The mystics of other persuasions do not think in this manner at all. They may transcend outer religious forms, but they do not emphasize the fact that outer religion is only a prelude to special experience. Most ecstatics remain attached to a rapturous symbolization of some concept derived from their religion. The Sufi uses religion and psychology to pass beyond all this. Having done so, he returns to the world to guide others on the way. Professor Nicholson, in The Mystics of Islam, London, 1914, emphasizes this vision of religion from an objective viewpoint in translating Rumi thus. If there be any lover in the world, O Muslims, tis I. If there be any believer or Christian hermit, tis I. The wine dregs, the cup-bearer, 
the minstrel, the harp and the music, the beloved, the candle, the drink, and the joy of the drunken, tis I. The two and seventy creeds and sects in the world do not really exist. I swear by God that every creed and sect, tis I. Earth and air and water and fire, nay, body and soul too, tis I. Truth and falsehood, good and evil, ease and difficulty from first to last, knowledge and learning and asceticism and piety and faith, tis I. The fire of hell be assured with its flaming limbos, yes, and paradise and Eden and the Harris, tis I. This earth and heaven and all they hold, angels, peeries, genies and mankind, tis I. Rumi has broken through the limits of the ordinary consciousness. Now he is able to see things as they really are, to understand the affinity and unity of seemingly different things, to perceive the role of man, and especially of the Sufi. This is something far more advanced than what is ordinarily called mysticism. It was not always safe in the face of vast numbers of enthusiastic and victorious Muslim zealots, to claim, as the Sufis did, that human realization came only from within and not through just doing certain things and not doing certain other things. At the same time, the Sufic attitude was that mysticism must be taken out of its utterly secret character if it were to become a force which would penetrate all humanity. In their own tradition, the Sufis saw themselves as inheritors of one single teaching, elsewhere split into so many facets, which could be made to serve as the instrument of human development. Before garden, vine or grape was in the world, writes one, our soul was drunken with immortal wine. The groundwork for the wide diffusion of Sufic thought and action was laid by the masters of the classical period, which may be taken as the first 800 years after the appearance of Islam, between about 700 AD and 1500 AD. Sufism was based upon love, operated through a dynamic of love, had its manifestation through ordinary human life, poetry and work. Because the Sufis recognized Islam as a manifestation of the essential upsurge of transcendental teaching, there could be no interior conflict between Islam and Sufism. Sufism was taken to correspond to the inner reality of Islam, as with the equivalent aspect of every other religion and genuine tradition. The great Sufi Khayyam, in his Rubaiyat, stresses this interior experience which has no real connection with the theological version of what people consider, by default, to be real religion. In cell and cloister, monastery and synagogue, one lies in dread of hell, one dreams of paradise. But none that know the divine secrets has sown his heart with such like fantasies. The phase into which what we call Sufism now entered was different in respect of climate and environment, but identical in respect of continuity of teaching. Rigid ecclesiastics, or formalists, might not have recognized this, but they were relatively unimportant. He who can see all the picture can both understand it and cater for it. Professor E. G. Brown comments, but even the genuine Sufis differed considerably one from another, for their system was essentially individualistic and little disposed towards propagandism. The fully developed Arif, Gnostic or adept, had passed through many grades and a long course of discipline under various peers, murshids or spiritual directors, ere he attained to the Gnosis, Irfan, which viewed all existing religions as more or less faint utterances of that great underlying truth with which he had finally entered into communion, and he neither conceived it as possible nor desirable to impart his conceptions of this truth 
to any save those few who, by a similar training, were prepared to receive it. E.G. Brown, A Literary History of Persia, 1909, page 424. It is sometimes difficult for a conventionally minded person to grasp how far reaching the rule of essential Sufic action really is. Since Sufism was bound to exist in Islam as elsewhere, it could easily be taught through Islam. It is instructive to note that two legalistic and theological compendia, obviously straining to present Sufism publicly as religiously orthodox, were written by Sufi giants, the Taruf of Kalabadi of Bukhara, died 995, and the first public Persian treatise, the Kashf of Hujwiri, died 1063. Both authors are of the highest Sufi rank, yet each often speaks as if he were an observer, not an initiate, as Omar Khayyam also frequently does, to the mystification of some of his trustingly literalist commentators. These authors are full of hidden meanings, never reproduced in translation, and it was precisely in this way that many of the orders of medieval Sufism proceeded. They continued their work, which was entirely valid within the Islamic world. Yet, as some Sufis note, Sufism was even taught at one time exclusively by signs. The end product, the completed man, is the same in both cases. The symbolism and chain of experience whereby Islam and other systems are reconciled through Sufi practice is another matter, vouchsafed only to practitioners and concealed in the dictum, he who tastes knows. Although many explanations are given, for various reasons, for the adoption of the word Sufi, there is one significant one which is taught to those who join these mystics. The word contains, in enciphered form, the concept of love. Also encoded, this time by means of a conventional numerical cipher, are the following words, which convey an abbreviated message. Above, transcending, correcting, a bequest, sufficiency in or at a reasonable time. Sufism, then, is a transcendental philosophy which corrects, is handed down from the past, and is suitable to the contemporary community. All religion is subject to development. To the Sufi, the evolution of the Sufi is within himself and also in his relationship with society. The development of the community, and the destiny of all creation, including even nominally inanimate creation, is interwoven with the destiny of the Sufi. He may have to detach himself for a period from society, for a moment, a month, or even more, but ultimately he is interlinked with the eternal whole. The Sufi's importance, therefore, is immense, and his actions and appearance to others will seem to vary in accordance with human and extra-human needs. Jalaluddin Rumi emphasizes the evolutionary nature of human effort, which is true in both the individual and the group. I died as inert matter and became a plant, and as a plant I died and became an animal. I died as an animal and became a man, so why should I fear losing my human character? I shall die as a man to rise in angelic form. Mathnavi 3, Story 17 This attitude explains in a Sufic manner something of the seeming differences in conduct and attitude of the Sufis. Keeping pace with the realities of the community, the Sufis of the early Islamic period stressed the need for enunciation and discipline, factors which were very much lacking in the expanding and prosperous society which was forming on the basis of military success in the Near East. The ordinary historians fail to note this fact and consequently look at the Sufis historically, believing that they can descry an independent development within the ranks of the devotees. Rabia, the woman Sufi saint, for instance, died 802, is said to have emphasized love, Nuri, died 907, shunning the world. 
Then, we are told, came a further departure, with a more involved view of life, speculative and philosophical, and much more a following of supposed trends from without the cult. This development is undoubtedly a fact, but its explanation is, according to the Sufi, very much unlike its superficial appearance. In the first place, the elements of Sufism were always there in their entirety within the human mind. Various forms of the teaching were stressed at different times. No man spends all his time enraged. Individuals like Rabia were chosen as exemplars of certain aspects of the teaching. Uninitiated readers of the records, deprived of the necessary contextual framework, have quite naturally assumed that such and such a Sufi spent all his time in self-mortification, that before, say, Bayezid, died 875, there was no similarity to Vedantism and Buddhism and so on. Perhaps these conclusions were inevitable, given the poverty of materials available to the ordinary student. On the other hand, there must always have been many Sufis who were willing to explain this point, to them, naturally, a genuinely known one. But it is inherent in scholastic thinking that something written down has a greater validity than something said or experienced, and it is thus more than likely that the living representatives of Sufism have been but rarely consulted on these points by academicians. The recognition of the climate established by Islam as a suitable one for projecting Sufi wisdom is easy to trace. In spite of the development of an unauthorized clergy in Islam, those narrow-minded scripturists who stuck to a dogmatic interpretation of the religion, Islam provided better conditions for propagating an inner doctrine than any of its precursors in the same area. Religious minorities were guaranteed freedom from persecution, an immunity which was rigidly adhered to during the period when the Sufis were becoming visibly active. Islam itself was a matter of legal definition. What was a believer? At the minimum, a person who would repeat the phrase La ilaha illa Allah, Muhammad ar Rasul Allah, nothing worshipped but the divinity, the praised one, the messenger of the worshipful, which is generally understood as There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. The unbeliever was a person who actively denied the words of this creed. Nobody could see into the heart, so belief could not be defined, only inferred. Provided that a person could assert that he subscribed to this formula, he could not be proceeded against for heresy. No dogma as to the nature of this divinity and the relationship with the prophet was fixed, and there was nothing in the phrase of affirmation which could not be subscribed to by a Sufi. His interpretation might be more mystical than that of the scholastics, but no power existed, no ordained priesthood, for instance, which could finally establish the ascendancy of the clerics. Ultimately, Islam as a community was regulated by the interpretations of the doctors of law. They could not define Allah, who was beyond human definition, nor could they precisely interpret messengership, a unique relationship of deity and man. Before very long, Sufis were able freely to say such things as, I am an idol worshipper, for I understand what idol worship means, and the idolater does not. The breakup of the old order in the Near East, according to Sufi tradition, reunited the beads of mercury, which were the esoteric schools operating in the Egyptian, Persian and Byzantine empires, into the stream of quicksilver, which was intrinsic evolutionary Sufism. The Sufis even established the principle, often to be accepted by Islamic courts of law, that seemingly irreverent statements made in a state of mystical ecstasy could not be taken at their face value for penal purposes. If a bush can say, I am truth, said a famous Sufi, so can a man. There was, too, a well-established belief among the general public that Muhammad had had a special relationship with other mystics, and that the devout and highly respected seekers of truth, Tulab al-Haq, 
who surrounded him during his lifetime, might have been the recipients of an inner doctrine which he imparted in private. Muhammad, it will be remembered, did not claim to bring any new religion. He was continuing the monotheistic tradition which he stated was working long before his time. He inculcated respect for members of other faiths and spoke of the importance of spiritual teachers of many kinds. The Quran itself was revealed by mystical methods and provided many indications of mystical thinking. In the religious sphere, the Quran maintains the unity of religions and the identical origin of each. Every nation had a warner. Islam accepted Moses, Jesus, and others as inspired prophets. Further, the recognition of Muhammad's mission by numerous former Jews, Christians, and Magians, including priests, some of whom had travelled to Arabia during his lifetime seeking a teacher, provided a further basis for the belief in a continuity of ancient, not localised, teaching, of which previous highly organised religions might be merely elaborations or popularizations. This is why, in Sufi tradition, the chain of transmission of Sufi schools may reach back to the Prophet by one line and to Elias by another. One of the most respected 7th century Sufi masters, Uwais, who died in 657, never met Muhammad, though he was living in Arabia at the same time and outlived him. Again, it is authoritatively on record that the name Sufi was in use before the declaration of his prophetic mission by Muhammad, Kitab al luma It is essential to grasp this sense of continuity of inner teaching and also the belief in the evolution of society if the Sufis are to be understood to any real extent. But perhaps the greatest contribution of Islam to the spread of Sufic thinking was its lack of exclusivism and its acceptance of the theory that civilization was evolutionary, even organic. Islam, unlike any of its predecessors, insisted that truth became available to all peoples at specific times in their development, and that Islam, far from being a new religion, was no more and no less than the last in the chain of great religions addressed to the peoples of the world. In stating that there would be no prophet after Muhammad, Islam in its sociological sense reflected the human consciousness that the age of the rise of new theocratic systems was at an end. The events of the succeeding 1500 years have shown this to be only too true. It is, for reasons of the development of society as we have it today, inconceivable that new religious teachers of the calibre of the founders of world religions should attain any prominence comparable to that achieved by Zoroaster, Buddha, Moses, Jesus and Muhammad. After the full development of the Islamic civilization in the Middle Ages, the contact between the indwelling otherworldliness streams of all peoples was to attain a far greater closeness than during the legendary days when practical mysticism was confined to relatively small, very secretive groups. Now Sufism began to spread in a number of different ways. The teachers who specialised in the concentration and contemplation counteracted the greater trend towards materiality by balancing materialism with asceticism. Asceticism, warned the great Sufi Hassan of Basra, died 728, can be masochistic, in which case its use is due to a lack of fortitude. Every Sufi had to go through a period of training, long or short according to his capacity before he could be considered sufficiently balanced to be in the world but yet not of it. Adapting their teachings to the needs of society, Sufi poets and singers created masterpieces which were to become a part of the classical heritage of the East. In circles where entertainment and frivolity prevailed, the Sufi techniques adjusted themselves in music and dance, in teaching through romantic and wonderful tales, and especially in humour. The concentration on the theme of love and the separation of the human being from his goal was early introduced into military spheres, 
where chivalry and the theme of the quest of the beloved and of an ultimate fulfilment produced further literature and the formulation of chivalric orders, subsequently significant in East and West.